Ergo. Hello. Hey, this is Ergo. It is indeed. I'm Kiss. I am Damon. And what we're doing over here on this pod is reshaping culture for the more liberatory and creative. And we got a special one for you. This was a special one for us. Very, very excited to bring to you a talk back from the brilliant play Stokely, An Unfinished Revolution. So a few weeks ago, we had the opportunity to hop on stage after seeing this play at the Court Theater in Hyde Park and be in conversation with the writer Nambi E. Kelly and the director Tasia A. Jones about this play that covers the life, legacy, demons, and revolutionary possibilities of Stokely Carmichael or Kwame Ture. And so for those of y'all who aren't familiar with Kwame Ture or Stokely Carmichael, welcome. Hey, I'm glad. <laughs> We're talking about the same dude glad, both times, by yeah, the way, just yeah. so you all know. I'm glad to, to be the portal to the familiarity. And for many of you who need a refresher, uh, Stokely Carmichael was an organizer with SNCC who participated in the Freedom Rides and became a leader of that organization and the efforts of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, as well as the organizing in Louds County, also worked for a time with the Black Panther Party, uh, is known to have popularized the language of Black power, which obviously shifted a generation of political thought and activity and legacy still lives with us today. But then he continued on um, past the 60s and 70s to organize on a global scale, particularly through the African continent through a pan-African socialist lens um, and really is a brilliant orator, thinker, writer whose teachings and works and speeches are rich throughout the archive. So I encourage you after this conversation, just go do a Stokely deep dive through YouTube or through wherever you get your stuff. Yeah, we promise it's actually like really engaging and fun and interesting. And you'll learn a lot. I think of all of the movement political thinkers of the 20th century who we've, you know, tried to understand in their own words his like oration, like you said, Dame, and the crispness of his ideas and being able to map that evolution. The guy was no stranger to a panel. He did a lot of them. And there's a <laughs> lot of really rich uh, ideation and like political pushes that he brought to the table. And so from some of that, uh, the folks at the Court Theater created this play that's kind of like a biopic style telling uh, of his life. The play ran through June 16th in its first run, but it may still be up either at the court or going up somewhere soon uh, by the time this episode comes out. So check out everything happening at the Court Theater at courttheater.org. And definitely want to shout out the amazing cast, the lead, and also homie Anthony Irons played Stokely Carmichael, also Kwame Ture, and certainly want to shout out lifelong loved one and homie Melanie Brazil, who was a phenomenal part of the ensemble. Um, and big thanks, love and appreciation to Camilla Rashid, who got us in there. Um, and much love to all the work that's happening over at Court Theater. Yeah, we love to talk back. We love a talk back. We're available <laughs> for that, uh, especially when it's around really interesting work connected to liberation. So without further ado, let's hop on stage at the Court Theater to talk Stokely. The Unfinished Revolution. Let's get it. Hi, everybody. I'm the director of engagement here at Court Theater. And it is my distinct pleasure to be with you this evening to welcome these incredible artists and these incredible media makers to be in conversation with one another. The press opening for Stokely is tomorrow night. And the previews are such an important um, period of time, I think, in a production process, but especially here at court. So uh, tonight, uh, Damon and Daniel are going to share a little bit more about Respair Media and the work that they do, why their digital storytelling feels like it is adjacent to the storytelling happening on our stage right now. I'm just prompting you. (laughs) Like, these are some things that might be a good on-ramp for people. Um, With our incredible director and playwright, Tasia A. Jones and Nambi E. Kelly. Uh, So without further ado, take it away. Good evening, everybody. And everybody, please just continue to make some noise for our playwright and our director for a really beautiful piece. As was for, like mentioned, I'm Damon. I'm Daniel. And we are the co-founders of Respair Production and Media, as well as the co-hosts of Ergo uh, and Help This Garden Grow podcast and One Million Experiments. And much of what our work 
started as and continues to be is in real time creating a liberatory archive of the movement work that's been transforming communities and our society at large for the last decade. So whether that's resistance to anti-black state violence, uh, environmental justice, economic justice, and the multiple inter secting sectors uh, that makes up <laughs> uh, today's movement landscape. Uh, and so we're really excited to be in conversation with y'all because so much of our entry point into the work that we do is about the relationship between memory, record, and how archive interplays with that. And I believe that this piece as an embodiment of a movement archive uh, really brings to life the legacy of Stokely Carmichael and really the collective liberatory movement that informed his work. And so I want to start there uh, first with, with you, Nambi, as, as a writer. When we started our show, one of the things we recognized is that there's kind of like two ways that it goes for our freedom fighters. Either a lot of their work is carried on through memory and through legend. So for example, here in, in Chicago, Fred Hampton's legacy looms really large, but if you look for his words or his speeches or his appearances, it's really slim in the archive. And on the other hand, we have someone like Angela Davis or Kwame Ture or Stokely Carmichael who survived for many decades and their archive is abundant and overflowing uh, with the record of their speeches, their talks. So for you and your process of writing this, what was it like interacting with the archive? Because so much of the story is it becomes overwhelming for him. Right? He has too many pages, he has too many words, how do I put this together in a way that is useful for the people? Was it overwhelming for you to go through that really dense archive or was it liberating and freeing and did it create some lightness to be able to interact with such a, a rich canon? Thank you for the... Thank you for the... Hey, y'all. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, for me, interacting with Kwame Ture's work, I've built most of this play during shutdown. So it actually gave me um, a really wonderful way of focusing my George Floyd rage. Mm -hmm. And it gave me something productive to do when I was just locked in my house, you know, listening to people, because I live in Harlem um, and I live right across from Morningside Park, right near Central Park. So there were a lot of protests happening that we'd be in our house and you would just hear people shouting and protesting down the street. So it really gave me something productive and active to do than just feeling powerless, which was a, a great way of taking my heart and giving it wings, you know, to do something that was greater than me in service of someone who was so great and so prolific. Yeah, I think that's such a, a beautiful um, direction and impulse that I think we've heard so many people talk about of in the moments of whether it's despair, overwhelmed to turn to lineage, whether that's direct personal lineage, movement lineage, intellectual idea lineage. And so I'm curious for you, uh, why was he the person you turned to? And what did you learn about him in doing this deep dive that was uh, surprising or something you didn't know? The origin of this, this whole project is the brainchild of the artistic director here at Court Theater, Charlie Newell, who is outgoing, and this is his parting gift to this community. He used to be babysat by Stokely Carmichael as a child. And um, I know, right? Isn't that deep? Could you imagine? Like, that's that's a wild your story. <laughs> right. So we had um, just done the adaptation of Native Son. It's a 10-year anniversary of that production. And um, Charlie and Which Steve I saw Al was phenomenal. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> And Charlie Newell and Steve Albert, who's no longer with us, he's now an ancestor, but um, they were like, hey, we think this is our next project. And as a person who is the child of a historian, who is also a documentarian, he's, he's also an ancestor now, but he wasn't then. It is my greatest joy <laughs> to be able to continue his legacy as a historian and to be my own sort of historian in this moment. So when it came to me, I was like, oh my God, this is a perfect marriage. My daddy gave me Stokely as a child. And so like, that's what we doing now, you know, the perfect marriage of the passion and the personal connection. And then the personal connection for me being a child of a historian and, and knowing that it is my life's work to continue that legacy, however it comes to me, because projects come to you in very different ways. I always consider it a blessing. And I always believe, and it, my life has proven that when a project comes to me, there's something I'm supposed to get, 
and there's something I'm supposed to give. And I never know what that is, but I'm always better as a human being, aside from being a better artist, like the humanity of Nambi continues to grow and evolve with each project. And this project, Kwame Ture's relentless commitment to black people, to African people, as he would call us, it's informed my life in ways that has yet to be discovered. And at the same time, like, it just makes me proud. I just feel proud and I feel really empowered by his legacy and his, his commitment to continuing to change and grow and morph because, the, well, the, the people need this, so I'm going to do this. The people need that, so I'm going to be a Black Panther. Like, whatever the drive was um, for him, now I'm going to go to Africa, now I'm going to do the AAPRP, and I'm going to work with, uh, uh, you know, continue Kwame Nkrumah's legacy, like... That just inspires me that you can continue to grow, evolve, change up until the end. When he died, he was recording uh, Ready for Revolution. He was recording it and he only got to edit like the first three chapters, I think. So the rest of the book. Um, but but that but that's the that's the that's the gig. Right. He was like like if you watch the last speech that he gave at Howard the year that he died and he was so passionate and and, and clearly like sick but that was secondary to what needed to happen, which was the people need to know this, right? And so whatever it costs me, that's what I'm going to do. And oh, man, that kind of passion, love for us. Who? come on. And so thank you for in that inspiration, making this contribution to community and to the legacy and to the canon, because now I think more folks can start to understand that that responsibility that he took on and embodied, like mm-hmm. he did it for us to continue it on. And so sitting here, I think it maybe push folks into that journey and into that activation. Um, Tate, I want to invite you into the conversation and continue to dig in that notion of memory and how the piece really plays with time. As a director, when do you feel like you found the groove of the really dynamic ways the set and the staging and the cues and the lighting and the special. lighting and the sound um, takes us back and forth through this wrestling with memory in this way that's like ripping through linear time. How, how did you find comfort in that process? Uh, when did I find the groove? Um, yesterday? Or did you find the groove? <laughs> we are still in previews. <laughs> and still finding it? Um, you know, I think uh, what Nambi just said is really beautiful is that every project you give and you get. And so with this production uh, and this story, I was focused on what am I giving? I was thinking about, well, what is, what is Kwame Ture giving us? What is Nambi E. Kelly giving us in this story? And Nambi is so great at writing time <laughs> and marking time in the play. Uh, we have like different ways of marking time. And so it was really a journey. It was a process figuring out how do we manifest that in space? How do we help an audience along? We're going all over the place, you know, we're, we're all over history and through his life and, and past to present and, and back to past and then back to a different part of the past, you know. And so there's a lot of um, movement in the play and we you know, with uh, my incredible design team, shout out to the designers of this show. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> we, we, we really went on a journey of like, okay, what are the different tools um, that we have at our disposal to, to mark time? Um, and so if you notice, breath is a big part of the play that's in the text. Uh, and so that was my first instinct was to use breath as much as possible. You know, you see the elders on stage breathing into Stokely, um, helping him transition from one moment to the next and then make his final transition at the end. And then there's, you know, sound design um, really helps us move from one thing to the next. And then, of course, lights. And Nambi was great about, like, writing in, like, I think there's a light shift here, and there's a light shift here, and there's a light shift here, and there was. (laughs) Shout out to stage directions. (laughs) Yeah, those stage directions really give us a blueprint of how the play wants to move. And so we took that and we leaned into that. Okay, here's a shift, here's a shift, here's a shift. And now how do we feel that? Um, So hopefully it was clear (laughs) um, as we move through time. But um, the way Nambi writes, there's a lot of room 
you know, for a creative team to come in and like find it together and imagine what the possibilities are. And so we really appreciated that freedom to, to play during our process. And that started well before rehearsals and then continued through rehearsals with the cast and then into tech when the designers uh, rejoin us in the room. Yeah, it's beautiful and very clear. Um, that, that movement, yeah, we're, we're right there with you and moving back and forth beautifully. Uh, and in, in taking on telling a story across decades, across memory and history and the blurriness between that, it felt to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you use kind of these other significant, notable, known historical figures as benchmarks through that. I'm curious how, from a writing standpoint, uh, that choice of like whether it's familiarity or people that audiences are less familiar with, how them as kind of benchmarks through the story developed. Uh, and then in having them on stage and moving between costume and voice, as a director, were you looking for certain mannerisms to convey this is who's talking? How did y'all find the balance of that? Our favorite part was every time the audience knew somebody, they would say, ooh. Mm. People got real excited. Like, oh, yeah, I know Diane now. Oh, yeah, I know. Me, I know. <laughs> that was great. Well, okay. So the very first draft of this play was like 150 pages, and it was like five hours long to read. And, and it was because... I fell in love with watching these characters through Stokely's eyes. So if you read um, Ready for Revolution, when he talks about Malcolm X, it's like, oh, so Malcolm X had a whole ass monologue, y'all. You know, and the um, producers and dramaturgy team, they were like, well, we want to kind of focus Stokely. I'm like, yeah, but isn't Malcolm great? And he's talking about, the, you know, the Schomburg and, you know, pick up a book. Da, 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 da. It's like, OK, OK, OK. So that was like one of the last babies I had to kill because... <laughs> Anytime I can put Malcolm X on stage um, and he's, he's speaking some truth, I want to see that. I should probably write that play. Um, <laughs> but, um, but it was hard, you know, because there was like, you know, as we were developing the play, are there too many people? There's so many ways I could have gone with this play. Like, I had an impulse to just focus on the March Against Fear mm -hmm. and to have the play be like a duet between King and Stokely, and then doing the flashbacks that way. So as they're marching, they maybe I should write that too. <laughs> but, you know, then you can focus it more because that comes in a, a specific period of time. But I was but I was like, no, but we've seen King. Like, and I love King, and the actor who plays Dr. King, I believe, is in the back. Is that you? Ooh, he's hanging out. I don't see him. <laughs> anyway, but um, so I fell in love with everybody through his lens. And, and I learned some things that I didn't know. Like, I didn't know about how prolifically Ella Baker and Diane Nash influenced him. I just, I just didn't know these things. And so it was like, well, we got to have Diane Nash and we got to have Ella Baker and we got to have da 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 And they were like, well, Nambi, you know, it's a lot of people to focus on. I was like, I know, but they all, had, they all played a part. It was like Stokely was like, he was like Forrest Gump, right? <laughs> like, I'm just in the room with all of these amazing people and here's a picture of me here and a picture of me there. And it was like, so it was very, very hard. You know, Bayard Rustin had a whole three pages or something, you know, because it was just so great. And I was like, but it's very long. <laughs> um, so I just searched my heart and my soul and I just figured out what it should be. And I did some trimming and found some essence and... Uh, Everybody had big pieces, like everybody had big monologues. Bayard Rustin had a big monologue about his moral charges. And I was like, okay, is Jimmy Baldwin had a whole, he had like a four page scene where he comes in and he's like smoking a cigarette and he's drinking. He's like, young lad, you know? And, uh, but that had to go. It had to go. I got to write a James Baldwin play too. <laughs> Yeah, write that play for real. It feels like a, uh, I a, a, direct that play. a, a black revolutionary multiverse that needs Say to be that. built is, is, what, is what I'm sensing is being seated in this. Yeah. And part of the challenge of telling the stories of a collective movement also through the lens of one person. Mm -hmm. right, right, right. Yeah, right. I, I think um, what we ultimately ended up with, as Nambi said, there were many drafts of this play. And what we ultimately ended up with and ended up focusing on was Stokely's family as well, right? You know, we have all of these historical figures and these icons and, and names that we know, but the names that we don't know, the people that influenced him from birth, <laughs> um, you know, his grandmother, his mother, his father, his aunts. He had three aunts um, living in his house with him, you know? He grew up with these 
people who informed who he was, right? Remember Umilta? Yes, he had sisters, right? Um, his sister Umilta was in the play at one point, and it was really hard to say goodbye to her. She was, uh, she was deaf. Mm-hmm. And so Stokely learned how to sign so that he could speak to her. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, wouldn't that be so dope? That you yeah, that, to is, learn that so so from the beginning of his life, like he was learning different ways of communicating with people. You know, it's just fascinating. There's so much. There's so much more, <laughs> right? That could be in this play, right? And that but was would, at some point, and, and was at some point. <laughs> but it would be five hours long for the director's cut over or the, <laughs> the writer's, the writer's, cut, writers right, you know? the writer's cut. Yeah, I was really excited about the idea of these family members, right? And what Nambi started to craft was was these links between the family members and these other people that influenced him throughout his life, right? And so you see his Tante Elaine portraying uh, people like Fannie Lou Hamer and, you know, Miriam McCabe, right? Like all of these people are in some way linked to those elders. Mm. And I found that really exciting to play with and and for our cast to, to dig into, right, is, okay, what's the thread, you know, between, we called them their base character, right, was was the family member, and then the other characters that came through to help tell the story, to help him achieve his goal, which was documenting all of this. And so they take on the lives of these other people. And so to that end, it wasn't about mimicking or impersonating James Baldwin, right? It was about... But the, the land cross did something. Well, I mean, <laughs> you did that, right? The you did that. Um, continent extension on a cigarette <laughs> smoke, that was correct. But it's like finding the essence of those people, exactly. right? It's like, what it, what is the essence, especially for the people we recognize, right? Like, what is the essence of James Baldwin? What is the essence of, of Dr. King that we recognize but also like how do the base characters those elders kind of live and like speak through all of these other people as well so i i have somewhat of a big question to ask but you've made such a container to hold it and i want to talk about revolution through this piece you've seen to build such a, a deep relationship with the life of stokely carmichael and through his matrix of relationships a connection to the black radical tradition at large, the black freedom movement through the 20th century. And so I'm curious, what did Stokely teach you about revolution or what it means to be or change your understanding of what revolution is? And how does that new understanding apply to your work as a writer, as a director or artist at large? That's a great question. Um, Thank you. (laughs) Uh, We'll take a compliment where we can get it. Yeah, I would say that um, for me, being here on the ground in Chicago and working on this play, I've been working on two other shows at the same time. So I'm working on three plays at the same time between the Goodman, Lifeline, and here. Booked and busy. Booked and busy <laughs> um, and exhausted. But Stokely taught me, when I get home from the, doing the show at the Goodman and it's 11 o'clock at night and I've promised Tasia new pages for the next morning's rehearsal, I'm like, wow, I really want to go to bed. But the people need this. <laughs> and that was the mantra. The people need you to stay up, Nami. The people need you to stay plugged in. The people need this. The people need this. The people need this. And so I would stay up after doing a show, a three-hour show, I would stay up and write till four in the morning, sleep for five hours, you know, and wake up and reread what I wrote, revise what I wrote, send it to our stage manager at eight o'clock so that she can print it by a 10 o'clock rehearsal. And that was my process. So I lost a lot of sleep because of Stokely. (laughs) But again, the the thing about being in service to something larger than yourself um, and to sacrifice, you know, particularly because we're, we're, you know, our young people are in a a moment of self-care, self-care. Are you taking care of yourself? Are you taking care of yourself? Yeah, I eat and I drink some water, but I'm on fire for freedom, right? And so that's the thing that jazzes me and that's the thing that I think about when I'm tired. I don't feel well right now. I was going to stay home and stay in bed, right? But I got my ass up and I stayed on 94 for an hour to get here, right? Because it matters. 
His tenacity matters, and that's the thing. So yeah, all the lessons, liberation, whatever, but at the end of the day, being of service to something bigger than you is the thing that I take away. Mm-hmm. Yes, ditto. <laughs> I, I think um, it's in the play, and it's, it's definitely in his book, that tireless effort. And, and we tried to craft that in the play, too, in the production. Is that, like, there's a, there's a, a relentless, you know, exhaustive push forward always, right? No matter what is happening, despite cancer, right? You know, through emotional pain, you know, through, through um, mental struggle, right? That, that we cannot tire. And I, yeah, I'm tired, I'm tired, you know, with a capital T. And I mean, not just because, you know, we've been rehearsing for six (laughs) weeks, you know, um, but because to be black in America is tiring. (laughs) And um, to be black in the world is tiring. And in the face of that exhaustion, to say, we got to keep pushing, we got to keep moving. Um, because if we don't push for us, who will? And so I try to embody that in the rest of my life. I fall short every day, because I'm not Kwame Ture. (laughs) But I have learned through doing this play that we just got to keep going. You know, it it makes me want to, inspires me to, to push harder, to move faster, and to activate others as much as I can with the work that I do. So we want to thank y'all for staying around and being part of this conversation. We want to thank Court Theater for having us and holding us. And we want to thank Tasia and Nambi for this amazing work. Go tell everybody about about this play and bring them out and come back again. Come see it two, three more times. Uh, And thank you so much for your work and for, through that, tire through that fatigue to continue to push and making this contribution to help meet the needs of the people. So much love. And we are at Respair Media. Follow us at Ergo or Respair Media, wherever you get your stuff. We're there. Thank you so much for having us. One more time for our wonderful director and writer. Appreciate it. Tell two, three, four, five, 30 friends. The unfinished revolution is unfinished, so you got to (laughs) come fill these seats. That's right. We got shit to do.